Hey guys and welcome back to my channel and today we are going to be looking at Iron Man 3 which released back in 2013. This is the first Marvel film released after the Avengers last year in 2012 and it's also the first film in phase 2 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Of course this film had a lot of hype surrounding it, everyone was still riding high from the Avengers and so many people were just excited to see where the story was gonna go next. On top of that, the villain of this film is the Mandarin, you know, it, he's like the most iconic Iron Man villain of all time. And Shane Black was directing it, and Shane Black is, he's like one of my favorite directors working today. You may know him as the writer and director of such films as Lethal Weapon, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, or my personal favorite of his, The Nice Guys, which they really, really need to make a sequel to. I, I just love Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling. I need more of them, please. So, you know, general audiences were excited. Comic book fans were excited. You know, everyone just wanted to know where the MCU was going to go next. So it should come as no surprise that this film made a lot of money. You know, it grossed a little over a billion dollars at the box office. Unfortunately, this film is also extremely divisive. Some people hate this film, particularly for what they do with the character of the Mandarin, which, you know, I can, I can understand, I guess. But I actually really, really like this film, and I would go as far as to say it's probably my favorite of the Iron Man movies. I think a lot of that does come down to the script by uh, Shane Black and Drew Pierce. I think it does a really great job of, you know, balancing the humor that you'd expect from one of these Marvel movies and also, you know, having a lot of heart to it and really unpacking who Tony Stark is as a character aside from just, you know, the Iron Man persona that he puts on. But we'll get to those things. For now, let's just look at the film itself and see how many kills we can find. Just before we get into the film, I'm sorry, me from the future gonna, is, is gonna interrupt the video for a quick second. But I just wanted to say that this video and this channel is in no way affiliated with Dead Meat. This video is inspired by their content. I'm a huge fan of them, and I kind of wanted to just put like my own spin on what they do. And if you guys don't watch the YouTube channel Dead Meat and you're a fan of horror movies, like, what are you doing? They do great work over there. They talk about horror films. They talk about the behind the scenes of how they were made. They, uh, they, of course, they count kills and do all of that fun stuff. They seem like really great people. And if you love, you know, learning about films or if you love horror movies, or learning about how films are made behind the scenes stuff then you guys should like 100% check their channel out they they make amazing stuff over there as I keep saying <laughs> but yeah I just wanted to just get that out of the way that I'm not like I'm not claiming this idea as my own or anything like that but yeah with all of that out of the way we can just get right on into the film itself so enjoy the movie opens with the destruction of Iron Man suits why? Well, we'll we'll get to that, you impatient bitch. Because we gotta go back in time to learn how it all started. We're transported back to 1999, New Year's Eve. This is pre-Iron Man Tony Stark, a time before he learned humility, and when Happy had a much better hairstyle. Here he's with a girl named Maya Hansen, a genetic biologist. And this nerdy guy is Aldrich Killian. He presents Tony and Maya with a business card and an idea that he believes is very promising. I have a proposal I'm putting together myself. It's a privately funded think tank called Advanced Idea Mechanics. Uh, she'll take both. Tony promises him that he'll meet him on the roof to discuss things further, but... Yeah, you can see where things go from there. It turns out that Maya and Tony are working together on something called Extremis, a project designed to grant the human body the power to regenerate and heal. But it's just a little bit unstable. This is what I'm talking about, the glitch. Have you checked the Telmeris algorithm? The what? Thankfully, Happy is here to keep everyone safe. Meanwhile, Aldrich waits on the roof, alone and embarrassed. Tony ditches Maya because of course he does, and now we're transported back to modern day 2013. Tony is relentlessly working on a new suit, one that allows his suit to fly directly to him. I'm the best. It's a bit of a work in progress, but that's enough about Stark. Now it's time to learn about a mysterious new foe, a man by the name of the Mandarin. Six hostages are killed here in this first video by the Mandarin. This sequence is incredibly chilling and violent, you know, especially for MCU standards at this point. It does a really good job of setting him up as this terrifying villain. It's clear that the Mandarin is targeting the US, 
specifically President of the MCU, Matthew Ellis. In response, President Ellis introduces Colonel Rhodes as the new hero, Iron Patriot. And this is immediately met with ridicule by the general public. I am Iron Patriot. Listen, warm. Tony and Rhodes' conversation here is cut short when two kids come to ask him for an autograph. I loved you in A Christmas Story, by the way. This incident causes Tony to have a panic attack and shows that he's still traumatized from the events of the Avengers. At Stark Industries, Pepper Potts has a meeting with Aldrich Killian. It turns out that these two have a history together. Happy immediately doesn't trust him. Also, there's a suspicious looking guy. Happy doesn't trust him either. Killian presents Potts with a holographic version of his own brain. This is a new version of that extremist project Tony and Maya were working on. Four head of security Happy Hogan immediately calls Tony and tells him about Aldrich. Happy then says that he's gonna go follow someone he calls the quote unquote shifty character. For the record, this character's name is Eric Sabin, but I'ma keep calling him the shifty character for the sake of this video because I just like that name more. Aldrich wants Pepper to join him working on Extremis, but she turns him down. Pepper returns home to find a giant inflatable boy and some romantic music playing. It's an incredibly romantic scene but there's just one small problem. Turns out that Tony isn't actually there to greet her. It's an empty suit he's been wirelessly controlling. We learn that Tony's just been obsessed with building new suits following the Battle of New York in order to deal with his insomnia. It's causing friction in his relationship with Pepper. The shifty character meets up with another sketchy guy at the TLC Chinese Theater, a place I still really, really want to go to. Happy is there, of course, and he bumps into one of them, causing them to drop their briefcase with some valuable looking stuff inside. Happy steals something and gets into a fight with the shifty character before suddenly this guy takes a good huff of whatever was in that briefcase and... Six people, including Taggart, the guy who blew up and caused the explosion, are killed in this bombing. It's an incredibly shocking moment, but luckily, Happy Hogan is not one of those included in this count. It turns out this attack is connected with the Mandarin, another bombing in his series of attacks. Tony visits Happy in the hospital and is clearly enraged by the whole incident. When he tries to leave, he's surrounded by the press, all pressuring him to act. Tony, in response, announces that he's going to go after the Mandarin in an act of revenge. So much so, he gives him his home address? Okay, cool buddy. Back at Tony's mansion, Tony analyzes the crime scene using a holographic recreation. He's able to find the source of the bombing and finds a heat signature from a different attack that matches the one from the Chinese theater attack. This one happened in Rose Hill, Tennessee. Stark gets ready to head on down there when they have a visitor. Turns out that they actually have a lot of visitors, but the main visitor is actually Maya Hansen from the beginning of the film. Pepper comes downstairs ready to leave the mansion and as expected, a big argument breaks out. Just absolute chaos when... I said we, um, What? Do we need to worry about that? Tony immediately sends his suit to protect Pepper as the mansion begins to fall apart, with more and more missiles being launched their way. Pepper grabs Maya and gets her outside the mansion to safety. Tony calls the suit back over to him and gets ready to fight back. Tony manages to shoot down two helicopters, killing the pilots. That's two! He's helping us count. I appreciate it. Never could have done it without you. The mansion is, it's just really not in good shape. It's just, it, it's never looked worse, I'm sorry to say. The destruction of Stark Mansion sequence is one of the film's most memorable moments, and a lot of it was actually done practically. Visual effects supervisor Christopher Townsend wanted to do as much of the sequence practically as he could. That includes having things inside of the set, and of course, having the destruction be real for the most part. And then we built it on a huge platform on a large stage in Wilmington. It was built on a gimbal. And for those who don't know, a gimbal is basically a, a platform that can bend and tip and go like this. Well, this one just broke in the middle and just bends. And it was a bit, it's like the Brooklyn Bridge. They built this big steel armature and they were literally able to just drop the set. This sequence still holds up great today. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that the set feels real and tangible. It's a familiar location from the previous film, so when we see it just all come tumbling down, you know, it helps raise the stakes and makes the rest of the film just that much more intense. Tony manages to fly away into the sky and he crashes into Red Hill, Tennessee. Another happy landing. How? 
how do you keep showing up in these videos? What, who is letting you in? Tony is understandably annoyed by all of this. His suit's completely out of power. He has no access to Jarvis or anything. He's completely alone, left to wander the snowy outdoors all by himself. Fun fact, Rose Hill, Tennessee in this film is actually played by a real place called Rose Hill, North Carolina. It was pretty much, as the filmmakers described it, a quote unquote failed little town, which is just like about the meanest thing you could say about anything. Everything was like closed down and the filmmakers could pretty much do whatever it was that they wanted to. Entire town, it's hard to believe it. This little town was kind of a failed little town. It had kind of closed up. This whole side of the street, all these businesses have been shut down. This, this was a church actually, before it turned into a bar. We got the parishioners to kind of shut down and moved them for six months and we made it into a bar. It really has this feeling of being like a ghost town in the final film. It's empty and just has this cold and eerie feeling which perfectly reflects where Tony Stark is at this point in the film. Tony breaks into a barn that looks like it belongs to some kind of a mechanic. Anyway, he immediately gets to work when... Freeze! This is Harley Keener, a young kid who's just kind of smart. Yes. Harley reveals his own tragic backstory here. Well, my mom already left for the diner and dad went to 7-Eleven to get scratchers. I, I guess he won because that was six years ago. Which happens, dad's leave, no need to be a pussy about it. Tony gives Harley a little something to help him, just a little a little self-defense thingy. Uh, it's, not, it's not important though, don't worry about it. Pepper then questions Maya. Oh yeah, we're in a different scene now. Pepper questions Maya, who reveals she was there because she thinks her boss is working for the Mandarin. Turns out that she's working for Killian. It's then revealed that Killian is actually working for the Mandarin. He's got a set set up for him and everything. The Mandarin enters and gets ready to film his next video. Tony and Harley come to a little memorial for the bombing that happened. Here we learn that there were six people who died in this attack. And now normally I wouldn't count something like this that happened off screen, but since it has a pretty big impact on the story, I feel like it deserves to be included on this list. The shadows apparently represent the people who passed away, but there's only five shadows. There's one missing, one for Chad, the suicide bomber. Their next point of action is to look for Mrs. Davis, who is Chad's mother. That leads him to a bar where they meet up. She hands him a file on her son where Tony realizes that Chad was connected with AIM. He was a former soldier who was experimented on with extremists. Stark and Mrs. Davis' meeting is cut short when a woman named Mrs. Brandt arrives and puts him in cuffs. She's disguised as Homeland Security, but it turns out she's actually another person experimented on with extremists. Also, it's illegal to impersonate a police officer, but I don't I don't think that's I don't think that's a big issue at, at, at this moment. I don't know why. I brought that up. A local sheriff and deputy come over to find out what the hell is going on when, yeah, uh, things don't end too well for them. Poor guys were just trying to do their jobs. Tony leads her outside where he finds the shifty character waiting for him. Tony ducks into a diner where him and Brant fight. I love this segment. I love that we get to highlight how one of Tony's biggest strengths is his intelligence. He gets to show that he's more than just the suit. Stark, using some quick thinking, tosses Chad's dog tag into a microwave and rigs it to an exposed gas line. The microwave explodes right next to Brant, killing her and sending her lifeless body onto nearby power cables. Oh my god. Anyway, afterwards, the shifty character knocks down a water tower and it knocks down Harley. In retaliation, Harley uses that little doodad Stark gave him before Stark blasts him with the little Iron Man repulsor he's had on this whole time and wait, oh, he's, he's not dead. So many things just happen in this one sequence, I don't know what to make of it. Harley and Tony say their goodbyes, but Harley makes one last plea to get him to stay. So now you're just gonna leave me here, like my dad? Yeah. Meanwhile, another Mandarin video debuts. This time, it's interactive. The president doesn't call him in 30 seconds, he's gonna kill someone. This is Thomas Richards, an accountant for the Roxxon Corporation, which is not important to this story, but I felt like mentioning it anyway so that comic fans can get excited. The president calls, but it doesn't matter. The president shoots him anyway and warns the president that he has no other choice but to run and hide. President Ellis sends Rhodes after the Mandarin, 
but it turns out that Richards might not be dead after all. According to the MCU wiki, that is the case, but I have found no evidence in the actual film that that is the case. So uh, he is being, he's staying on the count is what I'm saying. Tony sneaks his way onto the set of a news station where he's greeted by a cameraman named Gary. They work together to hack into Ames files. Stark learns that AIM was targeting former soldiers who were injured in combat to experiment on. They sold them the promise that extremists would help restore the life that they lost. Unfortunately, as shown in this video, that wasn't the case for a lot of these poor participants. Pepper and Maya have a little heart-to-heart -heart in a remote location that is quickly cut short when Killian arrives. Turns out that Maya was always loyal to Killian and planned for this to happen. Meanwhile, Iron Patriot is sent to a Roma rim rim Meanwhile, Iron Patriot is sent to a remote location, the alleged location of the Mandarin. But it's revealed to have been a trap and he's incapacitated. Tony, with the help of Harley, has tracked the Mandarin to Miami. He's planning on using the suit to infiltrate his base and take him down. But it's revealed that his suit hasn't been charging. He can't use the Iron Man suit. This sends Tony into another panic attack, which Harley talks him through. Harley encourages Tony to just build something. Thus, we get a badass engineering montage. Making weapons is always cool. We are then transported to Miami, where Stark infiltrates the Mandarin space with all the new fun tech he's got. I don't think these guys die, but oh my god, this sequence is so fun. The inside of the base seems a little too Woody Harrelson for it to be real, but that doesn't stop Tony from investigating things further. He comes across the iconic Mandarin bed, where he finds two st strippers? Stark is just as confused as you are. I wouldn't go in there for 20 minutes. <laughs> hey! Bloody hell, bloody hell. The Mandarin is actually a guy named Trevor Slattery, a British actor. He thinks the whole Mandarin thing is fake. Slattery was a drug addict, and it turns out that AIM hired him knowing about his past and promised to get him help. What did they say? They get you off him? Said they give me more. Suddenly, the shifty character shows up and knocks Tony out. Tony awakens tied up with Maya supervising him. Maya tries to get Stark to work with her again on Extremis, but Stark rejects this and also professes his love for Mrs. Potts, who quote unquote still has a soul. Killian enters and reveals he's still a little peeved about the rooftop incident all those years ago. So much so that he's gotten his revenge by experimenting on Pepper with Extremis. Maya, seemingly having a change of heart, threatens to sacrifice herself, but Killian doesn't really care. He shoots her and this is where her story supposedly ends. Except. There's a deleted scene, which shows that she did not die from her initial gunshot wound. She manages to crawl over to a workstation where she transfers the extremist files to Stark and asks him to destroy the program. But there's also a plant laced with extremists that's placed right in front of her by Killian, which blows up, killing her. Why they cut this scene out is beyond me. I don't know why they would rob her of this heroic death, it drives me insane. Meanwhile, in the same lair, the extremist soldiers are currently working on cutting Rhodes out of the Iron Patriot armor. Rhodes jumps out and begins to attack, but that's short-lived. You, you breathe fire? Stark, now being watched by these two guys, finally gets to do what he does best. This. Five. Here it comes. Three, four. Shut up. Five, four, three. Turns out his suit was just locked inside Harley's barn. Harley releases the rest of Tony's suit as he tries his best to fight off the extremist goons with what he has. Tony fights off the goons and shoots two of them, killing them. Also, we meet the best character in the whole movie. Honestly, I hate working here. They are so weird. Absolute legend. I love that guy. The rest of the suit makes its way to Tony. He's back in action, baby. And just in time to watch as the shifty character flies off with the Iron Patriot armor. Unfortunately, Iron Man cannot pursue him because his suit is out of fuel. He's gotta find another way to power up. This leads him back to the Mandarin. The Iron Duo break in and Rhodey kills two of the Mandarin guards. This all happens really, really fast. It's crazy. <laughs> Rhodes threatens Trevor and demands he tells them what he knows. Trevor tells them that they're targeting the president's plane. They immediately contact the vice president who it turns out is secretly working with AIM. 
He's got a daughter with only one leg, and we can only guess what he hopes to get out of that little deal. Fun fact, and I normally won't do this for cameos, but this is Jenna Ortega's first film role. And it's just, it's just insane to me that her first role in any movie was in a Marvel movie, you know? That's just weird to think about. This scene in particular just rose in popularity because of Ortega's inclusion in it. Even though this was like, not even, I wouldn't even go as far as to say that this was a cameo. Like I don't, that like that doesn't count. <laughs> now you may know Jenna Ortega from such films as the Scream Legacy sequels or Ty West X, or just you know, maybe a little known show known as Wednesday. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but it, we don't need, we don't really need to worry about that. It, we'll, we can just move on. But yeah, the, the, just the fact that this small, pretty much non cameo in this film is what a lot of people remember this movie by. It's just, it, that's like crazy to me. Like if you were to tell me like, hey, you remember that little kid from Iron Man 3? Not that one, the other one, the one that's the, the vice president's daughter. Yeah, she's gonna go on to become one of the most popular actresses working today. I'd be like, I don't know who the f you're talking about. Please get out of my house. Stark, who's been refueling his suit, moves to intercept Air Force One. On board, Seven has infiltrated the plane and begins his attack on the president's men. Seven kills the Secret Service agents in a very quick manner. I wonder if this briefly damaged Rhodey's reputation just for a little bit. Probably not though, I, I feel like people would have known. Seven moves the president off board with the Iron Patriot suit. Shortly after, Stark makes his way on board and fights Seven, who then blows a hole in the plane, causing the passengers to free fall. In return, Stark stops playing around and blasts Seven with a unibeam. Oh my gosh, I love this kill. What an end to my guy, the shifty character. You will be missed. Now we get another one of my favorite sequences in the entire film. Iron Man has to find a way to save all of these people who are... Together, they recreate the opening of Wii Sports Resort and manage to get everyone to safety. Now, this skydiving sequence was one of the most advertised parts of this film. Stunt coordinator Jeff Haberstan wanted to do this stunt practically, or as much as he could practically. Him and the skydiving team took two days just practicing the stunt. And we start building custom costumes with hidden parachutes. Jake Brake is the one who did that. He's been doing that since the very first Moonraker when James Bond jumped out of the airplane with no parachute. Eight days to shoot it, we ended up making 62 airplane loads, over 600 parachute jumps, 480 some hidden parachute jumps, which is by far bigger than any kind of a sequence like that's ever been done before. Now, of course, there were some things that had to be CG. Like, of course, we can't have Iron Man like really flying around and catching these people. But, you know, there was also some other things that they tampered with, like some of the uh, some of the background stuff and just uh, just other little things. In every shot, the skydivers are real. Some of the shots we did have to go with digi doubles for a few things, but the energy that you get from that shot, I don't know that you could have gotten any other way. This sequence is just, it's still a lot of fun to this day, dude. It just, it really blows my mind that a lot of this was actually done practically because, you know, watching this scene growing up, I thought it was just done in like a controlled environment, like in front of a green screen or something but you know just watching the actors faces there's just some moments that I, I don't think you can fake it just feels a little bit too real you know Iron Man flies away and oh oh shit okay so yeah it turns out that Tony wasn't really in that suit but now they need to look ahead they need to find the president and Pepper and stop Killian luckily everyone is at the same place a damaged oil tanker where Killian plans to kill President Ellis and have his death be broadcasted live on air. Tony and Rhodes sneak on where they find the president tied up. Rhodes and Stark fight their way through, but they're soon outnumbered and outmatched. That is, until... Is that? Yep. Are those? Yeah. A total of 41 different suits were created for this film, and a lot of it does feel like they just look like you know, a regular Iron Man suit, you know? But there's some that are like secret references to things in the comics, like little Easter eggs type of things. And I just kind of like the more chaotic nature of this scene. I love how hectic it feels. So, you know, as nauseating and confusing as it might be to watch, I still have a lot of fun with it. The quote unquote Iron Legion, as I'm calling them, begin their attack on the extremist soldiers. Now, in this scene of absolute chaos, we counted 14 extremist soldiers who all get killed in various ways by the Iron Legion. It's just... What the f*** is even happening? This isn't a complaint. It's more like... It's more like I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to focus on. It's pure adrenaline in cinematic form. I think it's great. Iron Man suits up and takes off to fight Killian and save Pepper. 
Stark manages to find Pepper trapped under a pile of debris. He tries to help her, but Killian intervenes and damages his suit. In return, Stark cuts off Killian's hand, which is a detail that actually matters, but you won't know why for a while. Stark runs off to find another suit to wear, but that's proving to be quite difficult. Meanwhile, Rhodey saves the president. Uh, I kind of glossed over that, but it was actually a really quick sequence, so I, I, I guess you, you really didn't miss much, is what I'm saying. Anyway, four more extremist soldiers are killed here, this time in a much less chaotic way. Um, thank God I can actually see and process what's happening now. I, I appreciate that. Tony makes it back to Pepper and tries to save her, but... Killian, of course, just begins taunting him. Killian and Stark have their big fight, just, you know, absolute chaos. He jumps between different suits. It's great. Ultimately, though, Killian manages to overpower Stark just before his new suit arrives and... Whatever. Stark sends the suit onto Killian and blows it up. Stark gets away from the explosion, but it's revealed that Killian survived. And now we get the line that pissed off comic fans for years. I am the Mandarin! Luckily, Pepper steps in and saves the day. She absolutely rocks Killian's shit, and she finally puts an end to the Mandarin. Or, well, this version of the Mandarin. Not the real- but you- that- we'll get to that. We'll, that that's, that's for a later video. Tony and Pepper finally reunite. Of course, they have their usual fun banter, but Stark seems to have made a very big decision. He wants to devote more time with Pepper. Stark activates what he calls the quote-unquote clean slate protocol and has Jarvis destroy all of his suits. Fireworks on Christmas. Oh yeah, this is a Christmas movie. Uh, it's a Shane Black film, so what did you expect, really? In a little end montage, montage. In a little end montage, we reveal that the vice president and Trevor have both been arrested. Pepper has been cured of extremis. Happy wakes up from his coma. Tony decked out Harley's setup and even gave him a new potato gun. And most importantly, Stark undergoes surgery to remove the shrapnel from his chest. Looking towards the future, Stark throws the arc reactor from his chest into the sea. Even without his suits or his mansion or the arc reactor. He will always be Iron Man. And I love these credits. Shane Black, I, I love you. I love this man. <laughs> I absolutely love the score for this film. A lot of the music made for these Marvel movies, like they don't feel particularly memorable. It's like there's the Captain America theme, there's uh, the Avengers theme, and then uh, yeah, everything else is just, you know, yeah. No one, really, I don't, no one knows what the Thor theme is. Hum the Thor theme. You can't because I don't know it either. And I watch these movies to do video documentaries on them. <laughs> but dude, the score for this film, that goes hard. I just love the jazzy feel of it. And it's just so big and so over the top. Like it's it perfectly reflects who Tony Stark is and that whole persona that he has. It's beautiful beautiful score on top of that it's just a lot of fun to listen to it's just so upbeat so energetic i just i love it so much it's one of my favorite themes in the mcu and i have no idea why they never brought it back for anything uh, it's, it's just a it's a huge missed opportunity it's so good in the post credits it's revealed that stark was actually recounting this whole film to bruce banner who had fallen asleep i drifted where did i lose you elevator in switzerland this leads Tony to start talking about some of his other past traumas, much to the dismay of the poor doctor. How many kills did we count in Iron Man's third MCU outing? Well, let's get to the numbers and find out. In total, we counted 56 people who died in this film, with 20 men, two women, and 34 unknown. With a runtime of 130 minutes, that leaves us with a kill on average of every 2.32 minutes, which is oddly low for one of these movies. I'll give the completed Gauntlet Award to Savin, aka the Shifty character. I'm a sucker for the Unibeam, you know, I played a lot of Marvel vs. Capcom 3 growing up. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, I just remember Iron Man shouting Unibeam a lot. Um, but beyond that, uh, man, this kill is just really, really brutal. There's a few, like, brutal kills in here, uh, particularly um, what happens to Brant earlier. Um, but 
it, it was really a toss up between these two and i think i gave savin the the win because you know savin's a bigger character and also just the we hold on his expression for just a little bit too long it, it's it's got this cold and brutal nature to it that's just it's unmatched by anything else in the film i think it's a fantastic kill nice job the broken ultron bot award goes to maya because why would they cut her death scene out i would have given this award to like anyone else but because we know what her death scene could have looked like and how much better it could have been man it's just it's just so disappointing to see how it turned out in the final cut i have no idea why they cut out the the original scene it, it makes no sense to me come on man just put it back put it back in it worked so much better for her character for the story it's just ah another missed opportunity and that's it iron man 3 was a huge box office success and helped kick off phase 2 of the mcu in a very very strong way next time we'll be looking at thor the dark world which is a lot of people's least favorite mcu film we'll get into why that is when we cover it um, until then, I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching. It really does mean the world that you guys clicked on this video. But yeah, as always, I want to shout out my sister who helped me count the kills in this film. Uh, I really could not have done this without her. She does a lot of good work. So, you know, I, I just want to say thank you again. And I also want to shout out Dead Meat because this is their idea that I am uh, kind of stealing, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, but I feel like, it, it, you know, if I am going to use their idea, I might as well, you know, shout out, shout them out and uh, hopefully get some new viewers over onto their channel. So if you like this style of video, if you like what I do, uh, there's a good chance you'll like what they do as well. They cover horror films. So if you like spooky, scary, <laughs> if you like spooky, scary time, go over to their channel and... Uh, Go get spooked. Or actually, it's not that spooky. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. But yeah, no, go show them some love. Go subscribe if you uh, if you, if you don't already. They, they make really great stuff. I'm, I assume that most of you guys watching this are already subscribed to them. But just in case you're not, go go over there and uh, give their videos a shot. They're, they're really, really good. Please. Please go do it. Help me. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, this is the most chaotic outro I think I've done in a while. Um, it's like, I, I try to say professional for like the video part, and then once we hit the outro, like that's just f gone. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching, as always. It really does mean the world to me that you guys decided to click on this video and watch the entire thing. <laughs> I don't know why I'm giggling. F stop. Oh my god. But yeah, just thank you guys so much for watching it. I keep saying it, but it really does mean the world to me that you guys, you know, watch my stuff. So, thank you. Long live cinema.